You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today's show is one where we're going to go a little bit, I'm going to call it etheric. We're going to talk about consciousness, uh, some epigenetics, and what broadly you could call energy work. And if you've been reading between the lines for the last 10 years, you might know that I do some of that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm a little bit more open about it now than I was at the very beginning of biohacking, because frankly, talking about light therapy, electrical grounding and eating butter and mitochondria was plenty for uh, for the world to absorb all at the same time. Oh, and uh, nootropics <laughs> and EEG. So as biohacking evolves, um, there's always been an aspect of consciousness and spirituality that's a part of it. So sometimes those realms intersect with the physical. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And our guest is Jules Arnes, who is on to make sense of all this stuff and has created some interesting stuff. Um, she does uh, run a company, uh, but you'll see during the interview what's you know what's going on, why she does what she does, and just you can decide for yourself. Like, how real is this? And my assessment is that it's real enough to pay a lot of attention to. And also, I think there's some gaps in our knowledge. So, Jules, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. I'm really happy to be here. And this will be fun to see where this goes. It will be. Your company is called BioQuantum Skincare Technology. And, and I mean, quantum is already pretty much woo, even though it's a hard science, but people use it that way. But you added bio to it. So why? Well, I've been studying the body on a bioquantum level. And what that means to me is you're looking beyond what's observed and you're in tuning, attuning to a, an intelligence that's stored in all of us. And I wouldn't even take it a step further to say at this point, just where I've experienced consciously and what I'm experiencing through others that are kind of joining in with where we're going with all this is that we're actually breaking quantum. And what that means is that we're starting to move beyond observation and stepping into an intelligence that's beyond that. And that's everything that we're doing. And so it'll be fun to see where the conversation goes. But when we say quantum, especially bioquantum, yes, we're looking at the quantum field of the body, knowing that our body is multidimensional, but it's actually so much more than that when we start to step into the intelligence that it's actually holding. Okay. Uh, I can I can parse and decode most of what you're saying there. Um, but how do you know? How do I know? You know, and that's one of those <laughs> things where it's through experience. And this has been, I mean, gosh, I've been doing this for over 30 years now. And I finally got to a place about a year ago that I wanted to do a step-by-step -step of how we actually have the ability to step into the intelligence of that's stored in our DNA. And I went on this journey and I, and I started doing it. But then once I started doing it where I could actually teach it to somebody else, I brought in about 25 to 30 people that I taught it to. And they're all experiencing and doing it as well. So it's, when you get to that place of how do you know, there's a difference between knowing something through the intellect and knowing something through the body. And when you know in the body, you just know. There's no there's no questioning. You just know it. And that's where I've gotten. But what is even more exciting is that other people have gotten there too. And then we get to reflect that knowing to each other. How do you sort that out from ego? Like, like there's, I have a, a, a friend, a, a guy who had the just knowing, and once he got a little bit of, of fame, he became very ego-driven, and suddenly he just knew whatever he wanted to be true, and he fell into narcissism. <laughs> you so, know, it's funny that you say that, because yeah. I was actually talking about this with a friend of mine about narcissism, and I was like, you know, there actually is a little bit of a space in there 
that we all are going to, as we step into this intelligence I'm talking about, have a little bit of that, but in a positive way. And so how do you know the difference? For me, you know it through the body, because if you're moving into the ego, there's static and there's interference. And people that listen to you feel it. I, you feel it within your body. So there is some sovereignty in this. And for me, when I say that I know something, I only know it as far as my perspective can hold it. It's only as far as my body can actually hold the frequency of what that intelligence is saying, knowing that that's not going to be it. Because until you become 100% human potential, you become 100% of that intelligence, you don't know it. You only know what you can know. And then, of course, where you're speaking from, am I speaking through the intelligence or am I speaking through the ego? That's a huge part of what we teach. And a lot of that is done by identifying what level of consciousness you're holding it in. For people with uh, advanced spiritual knowledge or who've, who've practiced various things for a long time, what I hear in all of that is that the body has a knowingness. And in for people who've read my newest book, The Meat Operating System, it has a signal in there that tells you whether something is, is true or not, whether it's knowingness. And it also has a really big signal, which is when you wish it was true. So you convince yourself that your wish was reality, right? And, and they're almost the same. It, it's sort of like if you open up the little systems monitor on your Mac and it tells you how much CPU versus RAM or something is getting used. Well, they're right next to each other and like they're kind of similar. And if you just glance, you might not know which one was, was running at full capacity. So it's, in my understanding, it, it's a, a subtle signal between knowingness and wishingness. Uh, and for me, the reason I can do some of the biohacking, the reason I write books with stuff that hasn't been written before, um, like with new ideas, is because the knowingness happens at some point, and I've learned through you know lots of different practices to be like, oh, that's a real thing, versus that's a, I wonder if that's real thing. Um, you've uh, you studied a bunch of different work, including an apprenticeship with a Lakota medicine woman. How, well, let's put it this way, of all of the spiritual journeying you've done to become energetically aware at the way that, that you talk about being, what was the most potent of all the practices you've done? When I set out on my own, I, you know, I, like I loved all, I've worked with some very high level masters and the Lakota medicine woman was probably the highest level. I mean, she shape shifted. She, she was the real deal. And I was really young when I worked with her. So I didn't even realize how big of a deal it was to have that high level of a master when I was working with her. And it was right, probably about 10 years after I kind of stopped working with her, I went through a couple other teachers and I finally got to this point where I realized the only way that I'm going to keep going is if I break free from what's already been taught and move into a frequency beyond what's already been talked about. And so that's what I dedicated myself to. And when that started to happen, I actually cut off all communication with meaning I didn't listen to podcasts. I stopped listening to YouTube. I stopped reading books. I kind of put myself in this place where I only thing that I could receive was the guidance that I was getting internally. And that was the biggest turning point for me because I started getting pretty high level information, you could say, but then knowing how to master what that information was saying was a whole nother level. So I'm going to say on my journey, that was actually the biggest turning point was when I stopped listening to what's already been studied and started listening to the intelligence inside of me. So you basically told everyone to stop listening to the podcast. Thanks, Jules. <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. I will say I have plugged back in and I'm starting to listen to, and you are one of the first people that I, I, I think I said that to you, Darcy, that you are with the first podcast that I listened to in mm -hmm. over 10 years. <laughs> well, um, I have a confession to make. I have never listened to a podcast. <laughs> Do you read them? 
Most people don't believe me. Our secret. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh it's one of those things where I'm like, yikes! Like my job is to make them, not to listen to them, because I just don't have time to listen to them. Um, so I'll read transcripts, but I don't have time to like sit and listen. All right. You list some of your influences um, as Bruce Lipton, who's been on the show, I think twice now, the, the father of epigenetic theory, you could call him. And even list uh, David Sinclair, who's a friend who's been on the show as well. Do you work directly with these people? Do you uh, take their information and sort of merge it in a new way? Like, What's, what's the relationship between um, those domains? Like one's science, one's kind of spirit, and one's epigenetics. I think like all three of those things is very much what I'm doing, but I'm going to be super honest is that I don't really study them. Uh, only thing that I know about them are what people have reflected back to me is like, oh, that's kind of like this. And oh, that's kind of like that. But I don't go and study them because like I said, I try to keep what I'm doing as pure as possible. And so when I need a scientist, I mean, the thing that I'm working with, especially with the skincare, we have a company that are professionals in med science skincare. So I don't have to know everything. And so from there, but I do feel like what they're teaching and what they're saying is relevant. And, you know, I'm going to be as bold to say is that really, I feel like what I've tapped into is kind of what's next to all of that. And so we can use it as a reflection and take it as information and it's all valid and it's super important and we want everybody to get there, right? But there's more and there's always going to be something that's after that. And with science, it's it's so, it tells us a lot, but it's not everything. And of The place where I'm starting to go and what I want to share and what I'm super passionate about is that the difference between observation and expression, because when we truly stop observing what's already been created, we start to tap into what's after that. And that's what I'm passionate about is teaching people how to move into an intelligence beyond what can be observed. Hmm. So what I heard in there was that you're tapping into what's next and then that there was also something after that. So what is what's next? It's the ability to exist beyond observation. So if you think about what observation is, so I knew it's like, how do we exist there? But that's the thing, Dave, is that I'm actually, I live in that space. And so what I mean by that is that we start to hold a field that is in the intelligence. And I think Greg Bigot and he actually deciphered the God code, right? So, well, we've already, so if we need to put, oh, we proved that there's actually codes in the DNA. There is, there are codes in the DNA. And when we start to tap into those consciously, what ends up happening is the cell turns on a frequency and the DNA is holding that frequency or it's expressing it. You can see it like the sun, like all of a sudden a light turns on in the the DNA and then the cell is holding, it becomes the sun. So if you think about the sun, it's its own energy source and it's only an expression or a projection of an energy. And that energy has an intelligence. Well, when we consciously continue to turn on these codes, our body becomes this intelligence. Well, where is our consciousness? It's in our body. So then all of a sudden our consciousness starts to attune to these codes or this frequency that has an intelligence. And then we start to advance very quickly. But what ends up happening is that you start to attune to this intelligence instead of observing the environment. And you can imagine what would happen if your cells started to do that. If your cells stop looking into the environment of your body to be told what to do and starts to see it's the truth of what it is through these codes, everything starts to change, even the way that our cells are dividing, I'm going to say. And do I know this for sure? I only know it through my own experience and what I'm able to see consciously. Okay, so inside our DNA, there's codes. Okay. Uh, and you know this because you have a felt sense of knowingness. 
One of my superpowers is the ability to trace energy. It's the ability to, I mean, I think a lot of healers out there. Believe it or not, I don't have any problem with you saying that. Some people will who are listening to that. <laughs> I don't know how to I'm do okay it. with that. You know, I'm okay yeah. with challenging yeah. because we only know what we know, right? Mm-hmm. And when we're challenged with something new, especially something that can't be seen, or tested or proven, we want to reject it, right? Because it feel we feel safe when we have proof. But there's so much beyond what can be seen and be and to be proven. I mean, there's a, a space where to truly advance into what we are becoming as human. My hope is that everybody will want to bypass what science can prove and then let science catch up later. Like, let's turn on 100% of human potential and then let us let the scientists study what that is. And so all I've done is kind of switch it around. So yes, there are codes in the DNA. I actively participate in those codes. And what I ended up calling them is DMT. So yes, there's DMT, the chemical, which we work with a lot with our Ormus activator, but we also work with it on a, on a frequency level. And so what we've kind of played with is that it's decoded molecular technology. And when we turn on the DMT codes in our DNA, we start to become the next of what human is, but what being human is. All right. For listeners, uh, DMT is a compound that's released um, when you're born, when you die, probably during a really, really good sex or during transcendent experiences, or when you just smoke DMT or 5-MeO-DMT or snort it, which are possible, or when you use ayahuasca, which contains DMT and other plants that inhibit the breakdown of it. So this is um, basically the land of machine elves. But what you're talking about there is accessing DMT in a different way. So is this actually molecularly accessing it, like turning on secretion of DMT, or is this feeling something? It's kind of both. So I'm going to take what you just said about DMT. I'm going to take it a step further. And I'm going to get a little personal here, but I feel like it's a story worth telling. Um, So DMT is something that I've been working with for a really long time. And I always knew that it had something to do with the transcribed information in our DNA that we're currently not really tapped into. And I also knew that it had something to do with all of the electric responses of our body that we're not using right now. And as I start to play with it, what starts to happen is I can see the electric responses of my body starting to click together, literally making a technology. So over a year ago, a really good friend of our family's passed away on his 22nd birthday. And It was a couple of days after he passed away, and I'm going to challenge some people here as well. He came to me, and the first thing he said is that it's not supposed to be this way. And I was, and I knew that he was saying that we weren't supposed to die. And he had me take out a piece of paper, and I started writing out a bunch of equations. And what he was showing was that, yes, DMT is released into the body when we're born. And that same frequent, that same chemical has a frequency, and that frequency is connected to the electrons of our cells, and it's also transcribed into the DNA. And that frequency is a hundred percent human potential. You could say it's a hundred. It's who we are beyond physical form. And then the electrons is what stores our consciousness. So then when we die, that same frequency is released and it leaves the body and then the electrons consciousness leaves the body as well. And we merge back into the frequency of that DMT. So the DMT in a frequency level is 100% source intelligence. You could say 100% human potential. And what he was showing me is how we can actually activate, if you would like to say, that frequency. And then we have consciousness as the tool to attune to that frequency until we become it. And he showed me all of uh, how all of this is happening. He said the one thing that we have to bypass is observing our reality as truth and that the only way to actually break 
through and become 100% human potential is to bypass our observation by attuning consciously to this intelligence until we become it. And that becomes the practice. So we literally become our own Google system and we can practice tuning in consciously to what the intelligence is saying. That sounds hard to do. And you're listening to this and you're going, I'm not sure what she just said there. This is the challenge of all spiritual practice is that uh, even if you read you know, 13th century translated Sanskrit cave meditation scrolls, and you can read all that stuff, but all they are is someone trying to use words to describe a felt sense that it's entirely possible that you've never felt. It, it's sort of like if you're talking to someone who's colorblind and you're really trying to describe red to them, but they don't know what it is. And you can just use every word in the, the universe. You're like, well, red feels like when you're standing near a fire because it's warm. And like, what? It, it, so I, I hear you dancing around concepts that don't have uh, that don't have good descriptors. And one of the things that holds us back on uh, on spiritual and consciousness levels is that we don't have a way to discuss it well, especially between different lineages, which is why I'm interested in neuroscience because, well, I'm like, well, tell you what. Let's glue this to your head and have you make a certain sound with your brain. And when you do that, you will be doing the same thing, whether you're Lakota or Buddhist or, you know, some other thing. It doesn't really matter. Um, like, can you make the state happen? Um, and I don't even think the state happens in the brain. I just think we can measure it in the brain. And um, so that that's working on sort of a common language for consciousness and people who are more conscious are usually nicer to each other. Thus, that's why you know, 40 years of Zen exists. Now, the, the proof is in the pudding though. So maybe everything you said is complete bullshit, right? Because it's very hard to prove, right? This is like your your sense of reality and, and I'm not looking to say it is or isn't, but the question is what can you do with it that we can sense? So you've made your bioquantum skincare. You talk about scalar waves in uh, in them. Scalar waves are a type of wave that that once you start it, it'll it'll continue uninterrupted for long periods of time. You can do it with lasers. You can actually see them in canals. It's a real physics phenomena. And I've used scalar waves and some technologies uh, for healing for a very long time. So you put it though in a in a serum. Right, and there's a bunch of other stuff, you know, a, a phytocell cream and and eye serum and stuff like that. So, what makes this different than all the other skincare stuff? Because people send me like buckets of skincare stuff all the time, and usually it doesn't make it to the show. Because honestly, there's probably five other companies who use the same packaging because you can buy these packages. So, it's what's inside the package that really matters. And if I read your list of ingredients, it's got like all the good stuff in there, but Okay, why is it different? What do you do? So, yes, and I love everything that you just said. So thank you for kind of challenging what I say because there's always a way that we can deliver a state of consciousness. And so that's what I've done with the skincare is, uh, you know, yes, it is a skincare and believe me, it is top notch. It is amazing. You're delivering a state of consciousness through my face. I just want to make sure that I have that claim clear. I know it sounds bizarre, right? I mean, we literally call it conscious living skincare. So what we've done is I have, I have a scalar device. I have a way of measuring the frequencies. I have a way of coding the frequencies. And this has been something that I've worked on for a really, really long time. And so what we do is we transcode the frequencies and deliver them into the ingredients of the product. And so when you are absorbing the product, you're absorbing the scalar intelligence and you're starting to turn on, we call it microdosing DMT, because you're starting to turn on the way it's coded is that it's doing all of the equations that I was given through guidance of how to do that. And so it's turning on those DMT codes or turning on those dormant codes of the DNA. And it's also working on all the other things as well. So it's not just that, but it is working with the scalar frequencies. And so when you're absorbing the skincare, you're absorbing the frequencies and all of the other 
ingredients, but the scalar frequencies are also working with the ingredients so that they are not only absorbing into the skin on a physical level, because as much as this may challenge people, we are multidimensional beings. It is delivering the frequencies of the products themselves into the cells as well, because what they're showing, and this is what, of what flower essence and black flower remedies and all those different things, is that the body can't actually tell the difference between a frequency of something and an ingredient of the, something. It'll take the frequency of something and use it just as it would an ingredient, especially when we're talking about the skin. So we are, you're kind of delivering the frequency of all the ingredients you're in delivering the DMT intelligence, and then you're working with the skin on a physical level. Some people might have a hard time with that concept about the body just taking a frequency and using it. Um, I was an early advisor and investor in a company called Happy that was backed by tens of millions of dollars of research on cancer um, and cancer prevention with magnetic frequencies. And what that company found, and I've had the founder, Scott, on the show, uh, what they found in double-blind clinical trials was that they could get the resonance or the frequency um, of a compound like coffee or cannabis or even a cancer drug, and they could record its frequency and play it back through their consumer device headband and get reliable, repeatable results even in mice. So there's no placebo there at all. And the implications of that and the things that you're talking about here with, with bioquantum and lots of other things around laser encoding of signals and all, uh, what we're learning is that we see meat and we see wood and we see metal, but we know because we're scientists that inside them is almost all empty space. Right, you know, there, there's some electrons and protons and neutrons and neutrinos and all that kind of stuff in there, uh, but really, it's mostly not there. So, our body's operating system, what I call the meat operating system, it's doing its very best to create a map of reality, but the map of reality doesn't have almost anything compared to what's really there, and that makes sense, right? Because you have a brain that's only so big, and if you were to try and, you know, when you look at right now, you look at me. Um, on your screen, if you're watching this on YouTube or something, um, you you just see electrons coming, or you see photons coming off the screen. You don't see all of the code. You don't see them being converted into electrons and being put over fiber optic cable and being routed over different networks. All this stuff, it's just invisible. So all you see is like the very skin of it, which is way less than seeing the little pointy part of an iceberg underneath. Uh, and so sometimes that can make you feel uncomfortable. It's like, well, how, I have to know everything. You can't know everything. Because if you knew everything, you would be everything. So this is why having a conversation, well, there's information in here. Yeah, there is. And my model of reality, and I want you to poke holes in it, by the way, if you have a different one, is that inside your body, um, each cell has a consciousness. And each subcellular component, like a mitochondria or a lysosome, they also each have their own consciousness because they have to, because I'm a computer science guy, like it's a distributed system, that's how it works. They're just not very smart, but they do have consciousness, like not even gerbil level consciousness, like way lower than that. And because of that, they're susceptible to things that affect consciousness, which would include intention, because intention does that. And so I don't have a problem with the fact that you use devices to put frequencies in here. And guys, if you're wondering how I built a $100 million consumer packaged goods company, do you think I put intention in that coffee? Uh, you can bet your ass I did. I didn't have to do with lasers. I just did it myself. <laughs> so you use tech. I don't know if it's lasers or magnets or whatever you do, but you have a way of putting scalar frequencies in bioquantum. What results do you see from your bioquantum scalar 33 serum that you wouldn't see from a similar set of ingredients that wasn't influenced the way you influence it? So at the very first thing that people start to, to notice is their consciousness shifts because it is holding your body in a field of frequency and they'll start to have higher perspective, clearer thought, it is a conscious shift. So it is, yes, it's skincare, but it's a delivery system of consciousness. And so when I say 
it's like microdosing DMT. And I really do mean that. And I know that sounds bizarre. And it's one of those things where you just have to experience it because it is raising the frequency of your body. And when you raise the frequency of your body, your consciousness is going to also raise and you notice it because you're conscious in the shift itself. How soon do I feel the consciousness shift? Because I was feeling pretty conscious before I put it on. <laughs> well, if you had, and I'm really bummed that you don't have the Ormus, but if you had the Ormus, that's the best way to combine it is I usually put the Ormus on first. I'll put it on transdermally and then I'll put this the Scalar 33 serum over but it is. it takes about over time, I mean, over time, especially if you're ingesting the Ormus, uh, you're going to start to feel it a lot faster because you're actually ingesting it versus trans. Um, let's talk about Ormus. Upgrade Collective members. Okay, guys, if you're listening, the Upgrade Collective is my mentorship and membership group, and we have tons of fun, and you could be in the live audience where I'm actually looking at them and they're typing questions and things like that. Um. Do you guys know what Ormus is? Just give me a little comment here. Just like a thumbs up or wave or something. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, so these are pretty advanced biohacker people. They don't know what it is. Most people don't. So I want you to describe Ormus, and then I'll tell you how I know what, about what Ormus is. So okay. what is Ormus? O-R-M-U-S, guys, if you're looking at this. So Orbited Rearranged Unidentified Summits, or or Orme would be Orbited Rearranged monoatomic element. So they are usually other monoatomic elements that are put into their into a spin state. And they've been studied a lot. And a lot of it, the easiest thing for it to study is what it's doing. So what it's doing is it's activating higher consciousness. It's extending telomere length, all of those really great things. But the part of it that I love is that it is what you could consider a fifth dimensional element, meaning that because it's in the spin state, that it is both physical and not physical at the same time. And for me, that's a huge part of what we all will experience as we continue to step into the next stage of human evolution is that our body has the ability to hold physical and unphysical consciously. And so when you're bringing Ormus, whether it's transdermally or you're ingesting it, you're ingesting an element that has the ability to be both physical and not physical at the same time. And then you could question, well, aren't I that already? Well, Yes, you are consciously, but what we're doing is we're bringing consciousness into that one intelligence. So what we're teaching is that, so on a cellular level, that the cell has the ability to also hold consciousness, both physically and in that higher state. Because if you think about the part of us that is is not physical. That's the part of us that we're advancing into. We have the ability to shift something that's not physical a lot is easier than we would to have it shift physically. And so that's what we're using Ormus for is the ability to bring the body into the frequency of being able to shift at a faster rate at a higher frequency as well. So we can talk a little bit more about it, but I want you to reflect on what what your knowledge is of Ormus, and then we can probably have some really fun things to say. <laughs> All right. I got into Ormus back, geez, like in the late 1900s. So in the uh, in the 90s, uh, I, I was really getting into um, alchemy. And a lot of people in alchemy, they were trying to turn you know, gold or lead into gold or something. No, they were actually trying to live forever. Alchemists were just some of the first anti-aging people, and they were looking to expand consciousness. And there was this element that they were searching for called the Philosopher's Stone, which was supposed to be able to do this. And there's some theories from a guy who explored the, the pyramids a long time ago. Um, that he found some powder at the top of one of them. And it, all of the stuff is wrapped in myth and story and probably marketing and certainly a few hucksters out there. Right? So you always have to take it with a grain of salt. But there is plenty of evidence out there um, that, that says like there, there's something interesting going on with this unusual state of metals. Um, this stuff was reported to have the ability to raise consciousness to affect your pineal gland. And 
the reason that I believe it's real is, um, well, there's recipes for how to make it. So I actually bought a bunch of sodium hydroxide. I had a little shed outside uh, my place in Fremont, California. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go make some Ormus. Uh, but instead, I helped to make the internet and cloud computing because I was working all the time and I was never home before it was dark. So I just never got around to it, but I had a stack of stuff to make Ormus and I bought some, but you never know if you're getting real Ormus or not getting real Ormus. And this monoatomic state has weird uh, physical properties. Um, there's also monoatomic uh, like rhodium and iridium and some of the other uh, more rare metals that you can get that have different effects inside the body. Now, all of this, you could say, Dave, you're crazy. And, yeah, I'm experimentalist. And so I'm willing to try stuff that probably won't kill me. And this stuff didn't look like it would kill me because other people ate it for so I tested on, I uh, didn't have to test it on cats. I got to test it on other humans who are at least as crazy as me. So um, when I would buy it, you know, did it work? Well, it works if you are equipped to feel a shift in your state of consciousness, which I probably wasn't back then because I hadn't you know, gone to Nepal and Tibet and learned meditation from the masters and gone to the Andes and spent all this time with neurofeedback and just learned from a bunch of masters. And when I use a, a real Ormus product, there is a subtle but noticeable shift in consciousness. Uh, I'm just thinking about it. You would feel it more, I guess the, the generic thing would be like your know, third eye kind of stuff. But but for me, it's uh, it's just a change in the shape of my field. And like, what do you mean the shape of your field? Guys, you have an energy field around your body. We can measure it with physics. Like that, that is not even something you can debate. Um, one of the ways I know this, and I might've told this story on the show. So if I'm repeating myself, um, well, most people probably didn't hear the other episode. Years ago, I sat down in, in Mountain View in California with the guy who invented wireless. He had the patent for the first 802.11 wireless um, in existence. And at the time, he already had a great beard and was, you know, 25, 30 years in tech. And he says, Dave, I took all of our, all of our equipment for measuring the, the field strength. And I turned it around on my body and look at what's coming off the body. Like, I know there's health information in here. And it pretty much looked like, you know, one of Alex Gray's paintings with some more static in it. Um, you know, the paintings of chakras and things like that. And he was all excited. And I actually never talked to him again. It was one of those just like, meetings of interesting people. And, but I still remember we were sitting on the street outside, he turned his laptop around and he was, he was like a kid because he was just so like, oh my God. And this is what happens when engineers start looking at biology. So um, anyhow, what I'm saying there is there is a, a signal, there is a field. And if you learn what your field feels like, you can consciously manipulate it. And you can also, and this is something you need to know about, you can consciously or unconsciously, for most of us, manipulate other people's fields if they are not well-trained. Uh, and this is why it's called biohacking, by the way, because if you know that this is possible, then you can prepare a defense against it or you can use it for good. So if you ever see me on stage and like, I wonder why that guy is whatever you feel about me. It's probably because I set my field up consciously before I walked on stage so that you would see and feel that. And everyone can learn how to do that, right? So does Ormus help you do that? I don't know. Does Ormus make my field feel different? It does, but not enough that I can quite describe it other than it's, it's bigger on the top, right? <laughs> So there you go. There's my story of Ormus. Uh, and there's all kinds of weird physical properties that have been ascribed to it that I don't know if they're true or not. I love what you just said. And this is kind of randomly going off subject, but this is coming to me. So I'm just going to share it. I am, I think this might have been the podcast that I listened to of yours. And you were talking about working out and and tell me if this wasn't you, but I'm pretty sure it was since I've only listened to like two podcasts since I've started listening to them again. And at some point you, you lay down and you put your hands over your head. Tell me if I'm. Oh making yeah. This. Instead of, so like during an high intensity interval training, you lay down and just like fully relax so that you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, that was probably me. It was one of the ways that, that led to rehit. I didn't invent rehit. That's an AI thing, um, but 
Yeah, that that's definitely something. In fact, it was John Gray who suggested that I do it. The, the Mars and Venus. So interesting. Well, when I heard that, I immediately went to. Uh, that was one of the things that I was told to do to connect lactic acid or lactate to that frequency of DMT was to do that exact movement that you were describing. I was like, oh, he's tapped in and he doesn't even know it. And so as you were talking about, like, is it doing something? Is it not? And that's what I think is so fun is that we all are, we're all having the experience. It's just whether or not we're aware of it. And the more that you bring these frequencies in and the more that you take things like Ormus or use conscious skincare or do the DMT codes or do the DMT movements, I have all the different things around the codes that we can experience by turning those on, is that eventually our consciousness does catch up. So I was saying that turn the body on and let consciousness catch up because it's shifting the field of your body, that field that you can measure. Well, the stronger that field gets, the more your consciousness is going to start to attune to it. And the more your consciousness starts to attune to it, the more you're going to be aware that there was a shift. One of the the weird things is when we say that field, it's probably more than one. Um, we have studies uh, going back to when I was an advisor to the Heart Math Institute years and years ago. They found out that if you walk into a stall with a horse, the, the spacing between the horse's heartbeat will change to match yours before you touch the horse. And is that a magnetic thing coming off your heart? Well, yeah. But the assumption is, well, it must be one thing, but there is actually no proof that it's one thing. So it's entirely possible you're walking in with 11 different dimensional fields, all backed by a uh, information field or a quantum field, or frankly, a bubblegum field. We don't even have its name. So whatever that is, we don't know if it's just one thing. And it's a human weakness that because we're trying to save electricity in our brains so we don't starve to death, we will make cognitive shortcuts and we'll assume it must be one thing. If you're trying to invent bread and you bake the yeast, then you bake the water, then you bake the flour, there is no bread. It's not just one thing. So I don't know, and I don't think any one person knows all of the fields that are involved, but there's something interesting going on there. And sometimes you can feel it, especially if you remove static and triggers from your nervous system, which is why you detox, why you increase cellular energy. Do I sound like I'm talking about biohacking? I am. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting thing. It's something else interesting. Um, when I use supplements, and you guys, I'm famous for using 100 plus supplements a day sometimes, I don't take the same things every day. I used to for years. But what I learned probably from Glenn... Uh, El Zinga from Alder Spring Ranch, one of the first hundred episodes, guys like a soil biologist who does cattle ranching. He said, Dave, look at the cows. They walk around and they find exactly the right grass and they'll smell one thing. I don't want that one. And they'll go and eat some other grass. And you can watch them like hunting for exactly what the body needs. So all of us have a system in our body that knows whether you need that supplement right now, that knows whether something is good for you or bad for you. And the way you can feel it, if you do something like, if, if you drink uh, the old Bulletproof coffee when I first came out with it, with MCT and butter, people go, that's gross. Like it's actually cognitively dissonant. But then you, you take a, a drink of it and, and you go, oh, and then your body wants more because it wanted the energy from the MCTs. Or with the new danger coffee, right? You, you take a drink of it, like, oh, that was good coffee, but it didn't just taste good. And then there's, there's a wanting of more. That's the minerals because your body's probably mineral deficient, right? So, it, and it's a subtle feeling, but it's a feeling of more. So I put paying extra attention versus just smearing some on my face before I go to bed, which is my typical practice uh, with uh, <laughs> quantum stuff. I put it on the back of my hand. And then about two minutes later, without thinking about it at all, my body wanted more on the back of my hand. And that is a really strong signal if you pay attention to those kinds of things. What does your body want? And it was like, oh, that was good, right? And I don't know how to put words to it other than this very long kind of diatribe here. But that um, that's how you know if, if your body wants something. Did the body want it without one thought going through your head? And did it bubble up? It's like, oh, I want more of it. 
I love that. <laughs> and that's our that's that intuitive knowing that our consciousness will will speak. And so yes, we had that you had that experience of putting the skincare on the back of your hands or wherever you put it, you're gonna have that experience. But then I would even take it a step further is that there is an intelligence that's running through that whole entire experience. And that's what I am super interested in is what that intelligence is actually creating. Because when our body is saying, oh, I want more of this and oh, I want more of this, it's starting to connect all those electric responses the more we do it consciously. And yes, are they starting to click together and turn on the next level of human evolution? Yeah, it's going to, whether we're consciousness conscious of it or not. But of course, the more that we put consciousness into it, the more we're going to get out of it. And then we go back to this whole question of like, well, how do we even do that? And that's a big part of what we do. So yes, we have this beautiful skincare line, but I also have an Ascension school. I have a school where we teach the consciousness that's in the technology that you're absorbing through the skincare. So we actually teach you how to consciously connect to the intelligence that's turning on. And one of the fun ways that we, I just launched this actually, and I'm not sure if you got them or not, Dave, but we have the DMT cards where I actually have the codes in what you could say symbols or codes that you can actually play with so that you're consciously starting to attune to what the codes are. And there's some, some fun different way exercises that you can do consciously with them. I don't think I've received those yet, uh, but I'm, I'm open to that stuff. And if, if you're listening to this going like, Dave, I thought you were a, you know, computer hacker and, you know, science journalist and whatever else you think about me. Um, yeah, uh, I am. And it's so weird that the Tibetan mandalas that they paint are specifically designed to induce states in the body when you stare at them and meditate them. And I've had guests of, of sacred geometry, uh, actually, I think they call it biogeometry even, um, on the show a while ago. Um, and there is no reason that looking at a certain shape won't have a visceral effect on the body. The reason we know that is a three-letter word. You know what it is? Art. Tell me. <laughs> the goal of art is to induce a feeling in a person who, who experiences the art in whatever form it is. And that's why we pay so much money for artists, because I don't know why looking at that weird thing on the wall makes me feel this. But it's as important as taste. It's just a level up or down, whatever, in our consciousness. We're like, I don't know, like that. I just like it, right? Well, why do you like coffee? Because you're a good person. But other than that, you see what I did there? Um, <laughs> um, you you like something or you don't like something because it's what your body needed, and it's the same for art, right? And it's the same for other people, and it's the same for nature and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I. Uh, I just don't have a problem with saying, okay, how did it feel? And that was actually scientific data. It is. So if you look at a, at a, a DMT coded card and the, the geometric geometry on it um, makes you feel a different thing or makes you ponder, then mission accomplished. And you don't necessarily have to believe in it. It either works or it doesn't. But if you actively don't believe in it, do you have the ability to block experiences with your mind? Yes, uh, that's usually called ego. Um, and by the way, bioquantumskincare.com slash Dave. And you've got the cards and you've got all the, the cool stuff. I want to go a little deeper with you as if we haven't gone deep enough. Um, you up for that? I would love to. All right. Now, you talk about how you're working to raise the frequency of human experience. Okay, I call that upgrading humanity. That's the mission statement for my company. So we're aligned there. Um, and you talk about how you want to break quantum physics. <laughs> you know, this is uh, when I started. So I started filming a course uh, a little over a year ago. And we our, our mission was to kind of travel around in different places and read the energy field of different places and activate those frequencies in the body or activate those DMT codes. But what it ended up happening is when we would go to certain places, 
that whatever field of frequency that that place had kind of matched the intelligence that we were trying to tap into. So, so it was more of a reflective piece on what we were trying to tap into. Uh, so when we were in our first spot, we were talking about observing the quantum field and how and what we started to tap into is that if no matter how far into the quantum field we were going, we were still observing it. And to be able to observe something meant that we had to observe it through our programming. And so we knew in that moment that no matter what it was that we were in observation of, that it was still part of programmed reality. And so that's when we got, oh, well, the only way to break the quantum field, meaning to move beyond observation, is to actually become the intelligence that we are turning on. And so that there was no gap between consciousness and the intelligence in that over time, if we continue to attune our consciousness to the intelligence, that we would just become the intelligence. Well, at that point, observation isn't needed. And then timelines and all of the different things that we experience in the quantum field fade away. And so that's where we got breaking quantum physics is that it's the ability to actually exist beyond observation. Because quantum uh, quantum physics is based on there being an observer, um, we think anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. That that's that makes sense. That that's why you're, you're looking at doing it. Okay. I was kind of wondering about that. Well, it's kind of fun to think about too. It's like, what does that even mean? Especially since we've been using quantum physics to kind of prove a lot of this more etheric or higher consciousness. It's it's kind of cool what they've been able to to discover through observation. And I think what we're kind of tapping into is that all of that, like use it, right? Let's use observation, but knowing at the same time that if we are in observation, that there's always going to be something more and that the, the, to come become a hundred percent that upgraded human is when we become a hundred percent intelligence and that we're no longer observing ourselves in our body, but we are in an expression of a hundred percent intelligence. It's, uh, it, it's always difficult to think about things that are feelings because feelings aren't thoughts. They don't even have to be rational. Um, there is, um, if, if you really draw a picture of it in your head, you're saying, okay, as soon as I pay attention to a wave, it becomes a particle. So if I don't pay attention to the wave, but I'm aware of it without paying attention, what does that even look like? Well, for me, that took about three weeks of having electrodes glued to my head, struggling with accessing a really specific state um, before I I could grasp that and hold it in my head. Um, And to be able to understand that to reach some of the more nuanced spiritual states, and I'm sure there's some I haven't accessed that are not accessed yet, but the ones I know of, usually you, you can't force it you have to allow it. And the difference between forcing versus allowing is just like, this is such like, you you start sounding like, like you don't really, like language wise, it it, it just doesn't work very well with an action oriented language. But that's the guidance that I give to people at 40 years is in, like when you get really stuck and it won't do what you want, well, maybe you have to just stop trying. And then as soon as you stop, then suddenly you can do it. And then you get excited. So you try to do it harder and then it stops. And you're like, gah! And you get in this like fight with yourself. Uh, I don't know that I would term that as breaking quantum, but it is accessing a state where you're aware but not observing. And again, there's a paradox in there, but all, all of quantum, everything is a paradox. What do you mean it exists in two states until I look at it? Like that's a paradox. <laughs> the reality is our interface on reality is very limited. And so you can hack your body's operating system, which by the way is a quantum system, um, or you can you know, hack the environment around you and, and all of that. And the reason I say the body is a quantum system, here's my evidence. Number one, you can get a PhD in quantum biology that's studying how quantum effects happen in microtubules and bodies and things like that. So we know that there are quantum inside the cell things. That is hard, hard science, the same science that makes quantum computer processors. So if you can have a quantum computer, which is solving problems for us right now, then quantum exists and we can use quantum effects. The other thing is a study that not a lot of people talked about that came out in the last few months that shows that 
uh, for the first time ever, they were looking at the spin of photons in a living system in a brain. Every time your heart beats, the spin of all of the protons in your brain changes in simultaneously. In other words, there's quantum entanglement between all the cells in your brain and cells in your heart. It's not a chemical signal. It's not an electrical signal. It's not a magnetic signal. It's not a light signal. It's a quantum signal. And that is 100% proof positive that we are quantum systems, which is annoying because for a long time we thought we are chemical systems. And then someone's like, oh, I guess we're electrical systems. In fact, there was a fight 100 years ago and basically Dow Chemical won that fight, which is why we have big pharma today. Um, But we're simultaneously all of those things. It's just the fastest and most foundational is quantum, unless there's another level below that um, that you'll have to break on some other episode because we're running out of time. <laughs> you know, one thing I want to just tap into what you just said is that we have something that we kind of play with is taking, moving out of the chemical body into the ascended body or to the new advanced form. And that is that quantum body that you're talking about. I mean, to start to identify in something that's beyond the physical is such a huge part of the shift of consciousness. But of course, we're having that experience in our own way. But I love everything that you just said. It's so fun that science is kind of catching up and getting to this place where we're proving that we are multidimensional. And that's all we're tapping into is kind of turning on more of the the frequencies to enhance that multidimensional form, allowing your consciousness to kind of go along for the ride. Uh, because you do start to tap into it over time. I mean, anytime you're adding a frequency consistently, and especially when that frequency is actively participating with your body to hold a higher frequency or a field, your consciousness will eventually shift unless you just are resisting it every single day saying, I'm not going to make this, I'm not going to let this happen. Then yeah, you might interrupt that field. But if you're open to it and you're inviting it in and you're willing to actively participate, then over time you're going to experience what the shift actually is doing. Very, very cool. Um, uh, I would say I'm, I'm intrigued by the bio quantum skincare, mostly because like I said, I get a lot of stuff people, uh, people send me and I, I get to try this, get to try that. And sometimes I just don't have time to really sit down and pay attention. But when I, I put it on the back of my hands, um, just when we were talking right now, like there is a, a very noticeable sense of like the body going, hmm, um, which is really cool. So thanks for making me pay attention to that while during the interview. Uh, and what I was using was called the Scalar 33 Serum. And you also sent me a bunch of other stuff, some of which I've tried. I haven't tried your cleanser yet because I have another bottle of cleanser open, but I have all your other stuff. So I uh, I appreciate that. And guys, this is this is kind of the cutting edge of of biohacking. Uh, so you can you know, decide you want to give this stuff a try. And of course, you get a discount, 22%, probably because that's some kind of sacred number, right? Master creator. See, <laughs> yeah, I called that. So go to <laughs> bioquantumskincare.com slash Dave and uh, get 22% off. And um, maybe give it a try and see if you feel what I'm feeling or maybe you don't, and that's okay too. But I'm always curious and this was a really interesting conversation about things that are hard to talk about because they're all like weird, mushy felt senses of altered states. So thanks, Jules. Thank you, Dave. And thanks for taking the time to kind of step into the frequency and share your experience with it. Of course. Guys, if you like today's episode, you know what to do. Hack your meat operating system so that you can become someone who's broken quantum, become 100% upgraded, ascended, uh, and uh, there's another word you use that I'm forgetting. Uh, what's the other word I'm missing? Come on, Jules, help me out here. Let's just say it's the advanced, it's what's next. Like you said, this is what's the next in biohacking is to kind of bring consciousness into what the cells have the ability to do. There you go. Tap into what your cells can do and they can actually do a lot more than you think. They're stupid, but there's a lot of them. So when you put them all together, they're pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, thank you for being a listener. Uh, thank you for being curious and I will see you all on the next one. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey.